Доброго дня всім, друзі. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you today at our meeting with Alexander Chekmanov. We're going to be discussing the, his project today, the project you will be able to watch and enjoy in 3D format in AI zone. And I mean the exhibition, welcome the exhibition, admittance is prohibited. Today we're going to have Alexander Chekmanov with us. We cannot imagine Ukrainian contemporary photography without Alexander Chekmanov. He is the author of the famous session, a series that have been already presented in European Museum in collections. They have been published as a separate books. And we're going to discuss that as well. You might know the Passport series, Donbass, the Left series, and the topical series of the famous years, the Deleted, the War on Donbass, and other photographic series. And I do hope we're going to have enough time to discuss all of that. And I'm going to be the moderator of today's meeting. My name is Vera Baldenyuk, and I am the editor of the Corridor Online Edition. And I would like to start with a very simple question. So, Alexander, how does it feel for you to be working in the times of pandemic? Do you have the access to your favorite people that you're usually communicating with? And how do you feel as a photographer what it's like to be working in the pandemic times? Hello, hello, hi everyone. Well, I can say it this way, you know, during the pandemics, I've had this opportunity to live my house, at least in the center. I live in the left bank. I usually take a taxi going to the city center with all of the protection measures that are helping me throughout the year to do that. And I've had a couple of photo sessions made, and I have had a couple of publications in German and Austrian uh, publishing houses. But um, I would say that, yes, of course. Um, so it is a complicated communication right now with the people with no place of residence, but you can always find them at the food banks. And I would like to say that the topic of the people who do not have the constant residence, it is one of the topics that I have been working for a longest period of time and still continue working. Okay, I would like to remind all of our audience that you can take a look at our exhibition, Welcome Admittance is Prohibited, at the DocuSpace spice.org in the framework of the docusynthesis um, program. You can take a look at the photos, you can take a look at the commands and listen to the commands of Alexander Chekhinov. You can read out the text, explanatory text for the exhibition and use other formats as, uh, for example, the VR glasses, the VR goggles, if you have them for the full dimension. There is a very big and complex topic of working with people who do not have the constant residence right now, who are in the worst situation currently. And the series of the pieces that we are discussing today have been made in 1999. It actually more than 20 years ago already. And do you have do you have a feeling that something has changed throughout this 20 years? While you are now um, following the very same people, the representatives of those layers of the society who are the most vulnerable and who have the least, least protection, what has changed throughout this 20 years? Do you see any changes at all? Thank you very much, Vera. That's a very good question. Well, I have to say, that I was really trying to film as fast as possible, trying to make those photos before the next century will get in place. And it was very important for me. It was not only the change of the century, but change of the epoch. I didn't know what was going to be happening next. I didn't know what's going to be happening in the year 2000. And I felt that the new life is going to start after that. Moreover, I was thinking and I was hoping that we will not have the mass people on the streets but unfortunately unfortunately now we see that people without no constant residence have filled in the streets and of course it is somehow connected with the war that hasn't yet ended yet and that still continues in Donbass where I have been born and my native Lugansk is still under occupation and my relatives and people close to me they still live there and a lot of good people have still left there, still left there. So I was thinking about 
I thought that from the very beginning of the independence, I do believe that we have good chances. I, I remember I was called out to the army in Russia and we were sitting there watching the TV and uh, we now learn that, you know, we are able to complete our, our military duty at home in our own country and I've used this opportunity. So I've decided that I'm going to be using that in 2030. 20 years we're going to be one of the richest countries but unfortunately it never happened like that and I understand that we now have more people who don't who live on the streets and the population of our country has decreased and people are living the country people are living abroad for for finding work and unfortunately we do not see the changes for good we have the war going on we have some territories that we have lost but anyways you know the photographers they should film whatever is happening outside Thus, I believe that all of the topics that have been represented in my photographs, and I would like to say that the topic of the mentally disabled people and the people without no constant residence, there are the topic that can be juxtaposed, and there are topics alike. We can see a lot of people like that on the streets, and I would like to say that those hospitals where I have been working in 1999, the hospitals that could provide up to 450 patients that had around 250 people who were with those people they've covered to whole villages right now they only have 120 people working in only 100 beds to offer and this is uh, the hospital the hospital shrinked and it can only cope with 100 patients now and I understand and I know that at the end of last year the employees of this hospital they have been trying to close the road the international road to Belarus they have been protesting against the closure of the hospital because they don't have enough money and I do I am afraid that this hospital will not exist longer okay that's clear but this topic of the psychiatric hospitals and asylums and their existence itself is not a very viable topic not a lot of people know about that not a lot of people are aware of that uh, even the people who are collecting the information for different international foundations it's a lot of people who are working with human rights from many different international organizations maybe it was the first time when this topic was brought out loud when we have started the medical reform, when we have started the discussion on medical reform. And if we will consider the materials that we have had at that year, three years ago, there has been a lot of things said that at the territory of Ukraine we have around 60 that kind of mental institutions and around 20,000 patients that require the constant treatment and the constant location in those institutions and I'm just saying very broadly those institutions just trying to identify that Ukrainian language is maybe is not very not yet suitable to represent some complex mental issues so the patients and the people who are being located in the psychiatric asylums, they're creating the situation when the people are turned from the subject to object of treatment. And moreover, the effectiveness of this kind of treatment has not been tracked by anyone. According to the recommendations of the World Health Care Organization, the medical treatment of those people can only be provided for up to 30 days. And then this treatment is either effective or no. In Ukraine, the situation goes that the people require more of the care and social protection, so they're still being kept in those institutions. Usually these uh, problems with mental health 
are very stigmatized in our society and I'm very interested in your opinion as a photographer. How do you see this stigmatization form and take shape? When do we and how do we marginalize people with mental and psychological issues? How do we exclude them from our everyday life and from our conversation about our life? Vera, well, for me, the, these patients associate with the homeless, and they are very, they're actually very common among the homeless, and people just try to, you know, not notice them and to ignore them, their existence. And regarding how many days uh, a patient must be held as an inpatient for treatment, I haven't studied this, this comprehensively. I'm not a specialist, but for what I've seen and the conditions in which the, in this dilapidation and poverty that these people have to live in, in this institution, I still saw uh, love, because uh, the Lily series with uh, artificial flowers, it's about love, love for people. And, uh, it's the series is talking about the personnel's love to their patients. They are caring about their patients, caring for their patients like they would care for their children. And it was so strange to see that this humane treatment would persist even in such dilapidated conditions, despite what their funding and despite their lack of resources and despite the lack of uh, pharmaceutical provisions, which is next to nothing. I know a case where uh, the doctor started distributing cigarettes and the patients would attack him and this was, this was probably one of the scarier moments that happened in a psychiatric hospital when I was shooting there. And it appeared that this hospital is also houses patients with tuberculosis. And I asked him, how could you give cigarettes to tuberculosis patients? And the doctor says, you know, there is a vanishingly low amount of money to treat their tuberculosis the way it should be treated. So we can't we can't really treat them. So a cigarette would be a moment of celebration and this is going to be something special for them and make their day. Of course, besides that, we would distribute candy and cookies, but this amount of help is so vanishingly small. And it seems that it's not only we try to ignore these people, these patients, but they, uh, they seem to be ignored and overlooked during budgetary planning. And, uh, also concerns the homeless, even in, in the capital. And I mean, if, if even in the capital, they're completely ignored and overlooked, uh, what do you expect from rural areas? Well, you know, in reportage photos and uh, there is this new ethics of covering the faces of those marginalized, including the patients during uh, in treatment. Your pictures were made uh, during, uh, uh, or they were taken uh, in 1999 when there were no such ethical rules and standards in existence. So when you were at your location, uh, what were the do's and don'ts? What was the ethical code? I, as far as I understand, your, your shooting was two days and two sessions. Yes, two days and two sessions. And I was actually lucky. I was lucky to find myself in the psychiatric hospital, and I was even more so to leave the psychiatric hospital with the footage that I've been able to shoot. Uh, actually, Semen Gluzman organized the trip. Uh, there was an uh, international journalist, uh, Garrett Joe, 
він, напевно, до кінця не зрозумів, що це було. Він був шокований, він не розумів, що це було. Він не розумів, що це було. Я думаю, що трансляція була трохи шокована. Але він був шокований. І було декілька фотографів з ним, які просто... were invited to go along, um, and I was lucky to be one of those photographers. Uh, the shooting happened uh, in two stages. We were given complete liberty as to what we could shoot. I don't know if we were allowed to the containment where the most violent patients were. I understand that some of the more com complex, uh, some of the more difficult patients were there, uh, contained there. Uh, uh, but for me, that was even more important. Uh, what's interesting is that when you come up to this, uh, when you arrive to the location, you have this one-storied building without any, without any bars. And the picture from our poster was a window without any bars. So if a patient wants to leave, it's not a problem. Well, I mean, they do lock the doors during nighttime, but I just must say that the windows are basically open. They're openable. You can open the uh, window and just leave. And I think that gives you at least a semblance of freedom. Uh, the most important thing is to, was for me to document how the personnel treated their patients. And there was a lot of uh, personnel, a lot of staff. And actually, two villages, uh, people from two villages were able to earn their living by working at the psychiatric hospital. And I realized from what is happening now, comparing to what was happening then, I realized that then were some better times. Regarding the do's and don'ts, there were probably some instructions, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, we could uh, film anything, we could shoot anything. There were no rules, there were no uh, specific prohibitions. They told us the facility, maybe they did prepare for our visit, but I mean, what do you prepare? There's, you know, they don't have these red carpets, uh, or they didn't, I don't think they cooked some better version of, of their lunch. I think what's most important is something that you cannot fake is the treatment, is the uh, attitude of the staff towards the patient. I mean, they're being, they're being pampered like children in a kindergarten, and this is something you cannot fake. And to me, that was tremendously important, and to me it looked great. You often say that you had this perception of the people who were interned there for treatment and they, they felt like children to whom you needed to find, you, you needed to make a bridge with, you needed to communicate with. So they were, they were amazed uh, at your uh, camera, they wanted to know more, but they actually didn't, they didn't ask you too many questions uh, as opposed to other subjects that you photograph. How did you label them internally or how, how did you approach the communication with them? Because in order to immerse yourself in this atmosphere, you usually would communicate with your subjects a lot. And you have to find some common denominator and some common ground with uh, your subjects. With, uh, but with people who have uh, mental issues, it's probably difficult to find this communication. What did you do? Thank you, that's a great question. I, it's not something that I really thought about particularly, but our common language was about body language, about gestures, and a smile at all times. Yeah, I see the many uh, pictures. Actually, I'll try to ask our technicians to show the pictures from 
welcome no entry and you could actually catch the smi these smiles and, uh, like, but not everybody did not everybody understood what this meant even to smile and I realized the entire seriousness of their condition I'd like you to show the black and white pictures or would you emphasize the uh, color pictures actually I'm interested in both and I wanted to ask you about the structure how this exhibition is structured in the uh, explanation and the explainer it talks at length about why there is reportage in black and white and color but I think in black and white there is more conflict uh, between the photographer's position who in a way softly imposes their vision of uh, the composition and structure of the frame and on the other hand there's the position of the medical staff who help you uh, set up the frame because sometimes you could even see the uh, you could even see the hand of the staff who try to maintain the frame in this position uh, to your could you talk more about the color part which uh, gives you a fleeting gaze on what's happening in the institution to this place where we know nothing about or, and this more structured black and white approach which tries to capture a person's look and tries to capture what make ultimately makes these patients human so how did you arrive at this structure well first of all it's very simple because I I've, I've been working in a newspaper since 1997 I've been doing if my fair share of reportage and you just what you do is you just uh, shoot and you don't intervene but with my style I always had this element where uh, I try to communicate and to draw the attention of my subjects to myself uh, and I try to communicate up to the point when the person will look into the lens so I was more interested in portraiture but again it was, the it was day one we just arrived and we were like a, a kid in a store everything is new everything is interesting and you want to you want to grab as much as you can and you understand that you're limited in time so so you just basically you wrap it rapid fire I, you know I had 20 films and uh, I filmed these 20 films 36 frames each uh, thankfully I was well stocked but after that I stopped and I understood that I start repeating myself I start walking in circles I shot already their lunch them taking their meds their on their walk and then again I, sh I shoot their mealtime and I understand that I'm repeating myself so I need to I need to shift my vision and in order to do that I needed to change my camera at least this is how it works for me so we uh, so we woke up uh, in a different department and we were uh, dressed in our own clothes and this was uh, this was uh, Mikhail, Mikhail Belyevsky was with us and he was uh, interpreting for Gareth Jones and uh, he, tr he tried to explain what's happening and, and I told Misha, listen, we are just wearing our track suits and some weird clothes. We can actually be confused for the patients. At a certain moment, I, I called a staff member, a patient, and he wasn't really angry. And he says, well, we're not that different after all. And after all, again, we needed to shoot I need, we needed to follow, like you're saying uh, correctly mentioning uh, you needed to find this humanity and this individual approach to 
each person in the frame, and each of them needed to be in a way placed in the, si in the center of the frame, in the center of this visual universe we were creating. This person needs to feel the most important, and uh, any communication has to happen one to one. And also, I wanted to make them laugh, I wanted to make them a bit happier. We found some artificial flowers, plastic flowers. So first I was just meaning to film their smiles and then these uh, flowers, they reminded of uh, lilies, uh, but this happened only the next morning. You wake up and you see that this is the new camera, the new film that you're making, and there's a very different way to see all of the things going on around you. And right now, uh, we're now printing out the color shots because we had printed the color series first and I would like to say that we have printed, it was manually printed um, uh, and we used that in photo vision and we have printed out the big formats of the black and white photos that has all been printed throughout the film without any additional, without any additional work and have printed it out for around 20 years ago and I haven't watched those, I haven't looked at those photos for 20 years and finally I have seen what was the color of the clothes for the people in the black and white photos because you never mind the clothes they're wearing. They're almost all of them are dressed the same. If there's no any additional um, features, then you already see the face of the person on their movement, on their feelings, on their emotions they express. And for me, that was very surprising to understand and to know that a lot of people didn't understand what it means to smile. And though there were so many people who were so many people still came up to me and they were smiling at the photos and they look just the same as we do. So, you know, there is no this kind of boundary between the different people. And our doctor, had, the doctor has said by the end of the day that it was actually a laughter therapy session. Then we had two medical departments that have been participated in all of this shooting and all of this photo shoots, uh, both the women and men departments, and we had the whole queue and people were coming up towards this artificial flowers in order to take a look into this magical photo room, or like whatever they have thought about this room or the box, and basically it is very important for us to say that it didn't end up like that. You're coming back home, you're getting back home, and you understand that the brightest emotions are still left there in this very place where you have never expected to experience those emotions. So you're sitting there and at your home place and start out to print out the photos and print the copies. I've printed out around 100 photos and I've sent it to those people so that they would have this photo to remember. And I do hope that for some months, for some years, or for, for some time, they're going to be keeping these memories of that day. They're keeping these memories not just as a physical object, the physical photography itself. I do hope that it still carries the certain memories for them. You know, when you have been discussing this issue of having the subject in your frame, we are once again referring to another film that will be shown in DocuDice You Are, the film by Alexander Palahura, The Life of This Object in the Shot. And basically, in this film, you might see how the object enters the frame, how it has been included, how it can be edited out, how they're working out in different ways to build up the artificial world of the film, a film on film. And it's all takes turns around to some couple of the ideas. One of those ideas being on working with a story with a woman that you have filmed once again as well in Prevost Market in Odessa, the woman that was called Alina, and there was a whole story of how you were looking for her. Can you please tell us a little bit about that, about your experience of filming that and filming her? Well, you know that says, uh, 
um, very interesting idea, but basically that photography, that shot, had um, caused the full story spin-off because Alexander had seen this photo and he decided that he would like to make a film about her. When he had seen this photo and he told me that, you know, we're going to go there, we're going to be filming her, we will find her. And I've looked at him at this moment and I said, like, you know, Alexander, I have some weird thoughts, but, you know, this is very dramatic for you as well. How are we going to find her? So many years have already passed. I have thought that it was completely impossible. And for him, for him, as for an artist, I think that the intuition has worked out, first of all. His artistic intuition has worked out. Well, oh, it, it was weird for me because, you know, I went there, I went for this search. It was very important for me to find her, to find this person. And I haven't maybe been thinking about that from the very beginning of uh, the two years 2000. I haven't been recording and those stories. Well, there was a person sleeping. It was Privoz Market. Who doesn't sleep at Privoz Market? That how, that how I thought about that at that moment. But Alexander has told me that we're going to find her. And then I have understood that this artist has a very strong artistic intuition working. We just got in the car and we have started searching for the person. We found one lady who knew the this person, her name was Alina, and we've learned the story of this lady. We know uh, about her very short life, unfortunately. And you know, when I was thinking about that, when you have asked this question, I have thought that she might be a patient of this kind of institution. She might have been a patient of that kind of institution. I wouldn't be surprised with that. And can I just maybe get back a little bit to the issue that we have been discussing before, just not to lose the thoughts? When I was uh, making this black and white lilies series, so I've tried to talk to those people that I was able to talk to. And I had a younger guy sitting there in front of the camera. He was around like 26 years old. And I was asking him, like, what are you doing here? You look normal. And he said, like, well, you know, I was uh, take going home from a disco and I has been hit on the head. And so twice a year I should come and visit this institution. And then the moment I have thought, you know, Alina, this lady, she might have been in the very same situation and she might have been included into this institution as well. So, you know, I just don't understand how it is possible that you might see a homeless lady on, on the street. Like, I, I, I can imagine a man, maybe he was drinking hard and he has lost his house playing cards or he has just got out of the prison. But how can you pass a woman who is lying on the street, you know, stepping, uh, uh, stepping around her? And, you know, we do not mind her. So I don't... I, I think that those are very connected topics. Okay, why have I got to this idea of having a person in your frame? Because what I believe that with your work, with how you work with a person that you have in your frames, you're trying to take down this um, regulated relationship between the photographer and the object of the shooting. When you're continuing the story outside of the frame, when, for example, in your project, and I know you don't like the word project, but once again, in this topical shoot in the hospital, one of the doctors have said that you have almost changed the situation and you have even helped one of the patients to get out of a very complex psychological state. And in other situation, when you are continuing to learn about the faith of the person that you have made those shots with, when you're sending those photos to the people who have been in inside of your photo shoot, you are basically returning their subjectivity to them, even though it maybe can sound complex. So do you feel that you have this responsibility with them? When, when do you believe that your power as a photographer ends and when it's your duty as a person starts to do something outside the photo shoots? Well, Let's do it this way. I'll just start with saying so. You know, 
I'm, I'm the person with a photo camera, and I'm not there only to work. I'm not there only to film. You know, I live with my camera. So you live as a photographer. When you're doing something for, uh, for a living, when you're working for a newspaper, you're doing it to earn your living, and you live with your camera. But it's just the same for me. You know, I do not actually have this difference of whether I'm working or not when I'm making the photos. And those people, those those protagonists, those heroes of my fo of my photos, they so you know they're they're kind of tracking me down. So it's either they follow me or their stories follow me. And as a person, you know, I believe that uh, if I am showing them as people, if I am showing their human side, their humanity. So maybe that is my main duty, my main duty as a person. So I'm not only solely act as a photographer. Behind this photo camera, there's always a person standing. So basically, you can teach whoever you want to make good shots, but to be a person, to be a decent person behind the frame, that is a completely different thing. It's either you have it or no. But I can say that, you know, the people who are acquainted with me through Facebook, then I do believe that there are some heroes, some people that I've been following from and checking up on them for more than a year already, and I'm supporting them. Well, this very year, I have uh, i don't know if I just recall somebody quite recent then you know I have sold uh, my photos for uh, almost uh, for a almost a hundred thousand grievances and I was able only to support two people with that well, you know, I, I do. There's a lot of things that have to be done. Actually, it's not just about that you have collected some money and you have just given this money to the people. Before that, I am being following and uh, dealing with these people for a year. I have known some people before, and I have got acquainted with some. For example, there is a family with uh, many children, and they're eternally displaced persons. They're from Donetsk region. They have a family of six, and they're expecting for a seventh child um, and one one night just you know the police comes for them uh, because they would like to uh, they would like to accuse uh, the father of the family with another case but he has already been he has already been He's already changed, you know, they're waiting for, they're expecting for the seventh child, and sometimes they even lock some food. You know, his wife is just like, asking me for 200 grievances to borrow her 200 grievances because she doesn't have the money to buy dairy. But she asked me not to tell her husband because he's, go because he's going to kill her. And, 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 and that day is the day of her birthday. So basically, well, that's it. That I just, you know, you just, you're still a person. You're still a human. You know, you're still the same person who was making the same photos with them. And there is the same person right now sitting in front of you. And there is the same question that rises for me. How can I help? How can I help? What can I do to help? Okay, the publication and the printing and the publication of my photos have helped. And Olha Vasilevska, the member of Ukrainian parliament, has helped in that as, a, as well. But from at the very beginning of this year, the father of this family has called me and he told me, like, you know, you've helped me to avoid prison. You actually helped me. You've saved me. If it wasn't for you, then I would have been imprisoned. And it, there was been a false accusation that they would take me into an incarceration anyway. So we have been working with him for this year, and I have been tracking his story this year. And I had a couple of other stories happening a year before together with Anna Adam, we have bought a house to them. Um, the same on the Facebook, you are just posted as a new, some people buy your works, and just one of my photo has been sold, and we were able to buy a half of the house for them, and we have got um, together with Anna and trying to make the life of some people happier. I know that from my childhood, I can recall that from my childhood, maybe I was around like nine years old at this time, or maybe maybe more, okay, it was like 11 or 12 years old by that time. And the teacher has asked us, so what is the sense of life? 
Well, you know, that this is kind of a question that you cannot ask children to answer, because basically I don't know what was the sense of asking this question, but I answered at that moment that the sense of life is to save another person. So this is something that I have from the childhood. I really want to care about people, to take care about people, and to save at least one person. If you have saved at least one person, then it is okay already. And this one person has six kids, so it means that you're helping those six kids as well. Two-year-old girl, she's just as old as my child, and I also found out that she's hard of hearing, and this is another uh, uh, this is another family uh, with many children, and uh, one of them is hard of hearing, and she got a hearing aid, which doesn't really work for her. She's not using it, and for this new year, I said that this year I'm going to help at least one person. So now this girl can actually hear, which brings me a lot of joy. But this doesn't mean that this is where the story ends. Maybe um, a year or one and a half, they have, they, she has to have surgery, but there the state will chip in at least somewhat. But unfortunately, there is no help to the homeless and to the psychiatric patients who are forced to live in the street. Just try to... Uh, just have you ever tried to call an ambulance for a psychiatrically ill person or for a homeless person? Usually it's the same thing. Uh, you call the Kiev City State Administration, it's either the number is either always busy or they would say, why aren't you, uh, why don't you call the facility at Suzdalska, which has uh, 150 beds, which are usually occupied? You know, what I'm really, what really kills me is this indifference, and this is something I try to fight against, and I think that these pictures are a document, and this document stands both as an accusation to the government, but we're not here to talk about politics, we're here to talk about people. So you are saying that these n this 90s period is very important for you yourself? Yes, very much so. So in order to understand something for the, uh, about this time, but then when I was browsing through some of your series, I was, I had this persistent feeling that uh, these series, they transcend time. Maybe, yeah, in one, on the one hand, this is a document of the 1990s, but then on the other hand, this is the reality that persists for a lot of people and it's still shocking and it's still very difficult to grasp. How does it work? How does it feel to take a picture to maintain it through time? And did you... Did you have this feeling that you're preserving something for posterity? Yes, this kind of intuitive feeling, which is very difficult to grasp and even more so to explain, but I'm talking about intuition in these cases. I understood that these, I thought that these pictures are going to have value for a hundred or two hundred, in one hundred or two hundred years. And my mission was to bring these pictures to uh, museums where they can be preserved for posterity. So when you were photographing, you were trying to look at this the time you are photographing from the standing point of the future, so you kind of try to transcend time. But of course, uh, I try to. I always, I'm always cognizant of the fact that uh, we are not eternal, and I tried to photograph people and events because I understood that there is a passage of time, and this world is but an illusion. No, but we are here for a very brief uh, duration of time, and it's very important what you leave after yourself, that you're able to keep, uh, maintain a human face, and that you 
are able to preserve a piece of history for posterity. And now I understand why I lived in Luhansk, why I couldn't live there. Uh, and I wanted to leave since I was 15 years old, but I couldn't. And at 15, I, un I understood that there is no future for me in Luhansk. And I had to learn, uh, either study either in Moscow or in Kiev, I actually made my choice because independence happened and since 1990 I went to uh, enroll to the Moscow State University, but then I realized that what do you learn, because every th what do you learn there? You have to stay here and you have to cover the life and the s story of what's happening from the very beginning of the independence of our country. For me, that was what was important. Uh, it's really sad that, that a lot of these people who are not very high profile, those not official people are leaving us. You know, when I had this exhibition in Poland in the early 2000s in Poland, I was asked uh, in Williams Castle, uh, what would you like to call this exhibition, your exhibition? And I said, you know, let's call this Ukraine unofficially, because those were the real pictures, of the pictures of reality. There were, it was not beautified, and it was about real life as it is. Uh, in one word, for me, it's very important to preserve these people who are not with us anymore. Who the, the, the time, which is not around anymore, and this fun of the 1990s, just take Luhansk, I was there in 2018, I went, I uh, saw my parents and I left because it's psychologically very difficult to stay there. I have no right, I'm not allowed to shoot outside. And there's not, frankly, much left to film there. But in the 1990s, these people were around. And they stayed in the 90s. You could say that they still live, they still live in that period of time. And it's very important for me to preserve these people so that they're with us still. And 200 or 300 years, it's important because without them, it's very, it doesn't make sense to show, you know, the folk dances and the, the cuisine and the bread and all of this official life of the country without showing the uh, real life. And, you know, these are these old people who, and you asked me uh, how do you preserve pictures and make them into a document. And I, as I was filming, when I fell, when I shot Passport and People in the Street, before 1997, I lived in Luhansk until I was 38. I, I had formed uh, a style, my own uh, way of shooting and the way of looking at things. I knew how I would shoot things. And even then, I did not think that I was a professional photographer just yet. I mean, I had an understanding of why I was living there because uh, because it's very difficult to do that as a visiting photographer. If I had left uh, Luhansk for Kiev uh, when I was 15, or if I left for Moscow when I was 20, then it would be completely different. But as I was resident there, that was the story of my life. And even in a small town, there's a doctor so why not have a photographer, a resident photographer? You know, during our time, 
Uh, you know, dur during during this meeting, you're welcome to make your questions, ask your questions. Uh, a question to you. Why is film important for photography? Are there some situations that warrant uh, digital photography? What kind of photography will be the photography of the future? <laughs> well, the, the last question is, is, is probably the best. Well, what is the photography of the future going to be like? I don't know. I'd want it to be humane. I'd want it to be about people, not about wars, and not about buildings. And by the way, by the way, about photography of the future, uh, recently my heritage has rolled out a feature where, which can bring some pho uh, photographs to life and people try to bring their relatives back to life. I tried to do that my own, but I brought my, uh, my uh, childhood picture to life and this was an, this was an awkward cringe-worthy moment because you feel this kind of alienation as this is something like you've lost yourself in the past and now this is coming as back as a, a very alien image and this is a very kitschy tool uh, I think in Balaguro's film in uh, the Odessa market there is this moment when the camera shows uh, uh, the, uh, fi these figurines which display some kind of pictures there is uh, there's this Virgin Mary and Jesus some pi these pictures that show a nostalgia of something that never happened so this this warm kitsch that uh, calms you down. So this is probably one of the directions where the future is going. But why do people want to bring pictures to life? Because pictures don't really need motion, do they? Uh, well, you know what? Make movies. I think now and even then. I did not have this person just like me, next to me, with a film, uh, with a video camera, a videographer. And coming back to your question of whether digital versus film, you know what, shoot with what you've got. It m what matters is what you shoot, not what you shoot with. Uh, I have a feel for film, so that's important for me. It's like with uh, bringing this little figurine of Jesus to life and these pictures that rotate. Uh, but I think that digital is just as capable and it tries to be similar to film. And I mean, cameras costing thousands upon thousands of dollars, but why do I need a copy of film? Or maybe something that's better than film, but here we see that this, sometimes you can see an image that uh, made with a camera that costs 50,000 euro, 10,000 euro, just like with Hasselblad's, but, and it's, but I can make images that are not so much worse with a camera that costs a hundred dollars. I don't think that gear really matters. I think it's a matter of personal choice. It's just a discussion on tools and uh, reflecting on the events of the Maidan in 2014. It would probably, I thought that it would, some of, it would be great that someone made a Super 8 or 16 mil film and make these events historic. Uh, you could also do that digitally, but remember how Strinvitsky uh, in Cannes uh, won a Palme d'Or for his student film, 16 mil film, where ev everything was calculated up until uh, up to a second. 
I mean, film imposes constraints, it disciplines you, and if you feel, if you feel that, if you benefit that from that, use film. That's like love, you don't choose it. Like, you know, you can love digital, you can love film. Some people love digital, I mean. What's really important is the result. Uh, coming back to this discussion on the photography of the future, I think that photography, there's a lot of photography. There's a lot of different types of photography. It's a huge iceberg. People shoot a lot, but I think ultimately photography is there to uh, to maybe discover problems and issues, because this is a document. Just to show you that it shouldn't be this way in this case, that you have to change something about it. Just the same for the photo and the videos itself. I do believe it is applicable to the videos as well. So they have to have a meaning, they have to have a message at least. And I do believe that the lots of people, they see the aesthetic side of it, but what we see in the photos, what we see in the movies, that's is also the message, the weapon of the message that it carries. And when we are on this kind of war, you know, the photographer in the wartime, they have no right to take any kind of other weapons than the camera because they are already having the camera as a weapon. Okay, if we will get back to the series of the photos that you have made in the mental institution and you have mentioned it and uh, we can see that in a couple of the shorts and we can ask our technical team to show the photo number two. And you can see you can see the patients uh, working on the stuff that they are very alike. There's no very big difference between them, at least for the specific clothes. So once again, the white gowns. Yes, only by white gowns. Only the white gowns that give you the difference between the staff and the patient. Yes, in some shots, they look like a family or maybe like, you know, like a school class where they had teacher, something very friendly. And we know that the situation of the photo has created this kind of ambience. But in the same time, those roles, they are very unclear when people have spent so many years together. They have a very deep connection with one another. And for some shots, you can see that there is this kind of unseen vertical of power. And if we will speak in those terms of terms of Michel Foucault, then it's basically there is a disciplinary theme that can only seen with uh, in a half movement how the doctor shows something and holds someone back, especially in one of those shots when one lady is trying to cover the other lady with a blanket. This movement that she with what she shows to stand back. How did you feel about those relationship between the staff and the patient? You've mentioned that they were mostly friendly. So was it like that? Do you think that they have felt the same, the staff, the employees of the mental institutions, whether they felt the same as the patients? They felt like they have the secondary roles in your shots, so they have felt the active participation to that. In the Lily's series, I have a couple of photos when the patient is hugging when the high patient has been hugged by the doctors and they're standing there together with them or whether the nurse well sometimes it, it's better to call them the medical staff so they have been posing and watching looking inside of the cameras so basically they also wanted to participate in the shot okay can you please tell us about this album the photo book that you have published last year can you please tell us more about that and can you tell us where can we find it well, okay, so this is uh, the first book of Lilith's series. It hasn't been published before. And finally, I have started to be published. <laughs> Let us put it this way, because the first book that I have published, that was the book by uh, Pavlo Hudimov, uh, has been edited by Pavlo Hudimov, the, the black and white photos in Ukraine. And I have it all has started with that. It was 2007. 
And in 2011, we had another publication made in this collaboration with the photos of Donbass. And we've needed to get a lot of money to do that, to sell money near Kiev in order to publish this book 10 years ago, to publish a photo book in order to do that in one of the biggest publishing houses. And we wanted to do that in one of the main German publishing houses. It costs a lot of money. I do believe it would cost even more right now. But by that time, it was very important. It was very important to preserve all of the materials in the framework of the book. Because, you know, the exhibition will pass. And what we will have in the end afterwards, we have to have this kind of physical fixation of that. If we didn't have the isolation, if we didn't have the overall isolation, if we didn't have these borders between the arts and people, then what's how, how it's going to happen? The exhibition is timeless. It's, it's specifically, it has some li limits of time. So basically, you either enter the exhibition and see that, and you either see it or no. But by that time, the only thing that I have had in my mind of how can you preserve the photographs in the highest quality is a book. The second book was the Passport series, and we have also invested hardly into that to publish it with a UK publisher. And last year, Sergei Mordensky, who has been the founder of the first photographing museum in Ukraine, and he is actually the person who actually also acts as publisher, he starts to print out and publish the books with his own money. He is also a photographer himself, and he underst understands what has to be left after us, what has to be left behind. So basically, it all meets all the ends here. So by the way, this is just the photo with the medical staff when we have been spoke speaking about the nurses and the doctors of this mental institution. The book can be ordered at the site of the Harki Photography Museum. And I would like to tell you as well that there has been a lot of people who have been working to make this book possible. Andrei Yermolenko, the artist of the book, he has been uh, working on getting the um, photos prepared. There was Andrei Lomakin, Lomakin and Colin Cruzo, the artist as well, our editor and the head of the museum, Sergei Lebodinsky, the publisher and the editor of this book. What else? What else? What was the question, by the way, about the book? <laughs> the relationship between the patients and the medical staff that who have spent a lot of time with them. But, you know, um, I believe that there are some really complex patients. It's not just I believe that there are. I've seen that there are some people who are actually not aware of what's going on around them, who understand nothing. So I guess that maybe that's why they have those additional gestures there. Maybe they have the strictness on their faces. They have those two noses who are always ready to hold the person up if the person is falling down. So basically, there's always the moment that there are people ready to catch you. So I believe that, unfortunately, there is the big need to have the medical staff always present, because there might be the room full of around 20 people there. And if you're going to, and there might be some conflicts rising at them. So and who's going to be stopping the conflicts if they will appear? And you cannot always work with a smile. But I do believe that it, in a way, resembles a jail. That's true, possibly, possibly. <coughs> because basically, that is the very same system. Yes, yes, right, you are. Those are the closed up places, the systems of the closed institutions, yes. But, you know, the same thing like two years ago, I really wanted to go to the Verkhnya Tepla in Lugansk region that is basically outside um, the front line in the so-called gray zone. There is an orphanage house for 
mentally disabled people, and I was I was filming there in 1995 for the Passport series, and here we had always had some people who were able to go to take a day off from this mental institution, from this mental orphanage. Um, they were able to go for a walk on Easter time, and they were always going out for a walk to the cemetery, and they've collected the candies, the cakes that were the leftovers of the Eastern tradition in Ukraine, and they were not doing that not because they've had the best of their life by that time, but just that there was 1995, that because of the need. And I know that the farmers, the local farmers are supporting this institution right now, they're helping them with the vegetables and fruits, and I don't know what's going on with meat for them. I've tried to get there with the help of the locals, with the help of the people who are supporting this house and this institution. But the head of this institution, she said, we never had any kind of inspections. What, what do you mean an inspection? You know, we are in the war zone. But basically, telling it's like, are you closed up from the world? So there's no way how you can get to you. Or like, but that means that there's definitely something wrong going on in this mental institution. Because, you know, I know that starting from 1995, there's something wrong going on in there. So I do not understand why can't we reach those institutions? Why can't we get into those institutions? I do know that right now for almost a year already, even before the coronavirus, I've had a project, and I can say a project in this way because it was the very first one, and we really needed to go to the five prisons to the five prisons when the people are held and there was one women prison that was in, located in Gachanivka and four other prisons that are being used to keep men and we have spoken to around 40 people one on one. So why you can reach the people who will be going to captain prison for forever and you cannot talk to the people held in mental institutions. And I can see how those borders and those lines that are currently decreasing and melting down. And I know that I believe that you can already get into this kind of mental institution. It's not Soviet times already. In the Soviet times, the mental institutions used to be the real prisons. What I have seen, there have been the photos of the people who have been tied up to their beds or the people crawling on the floor. That was terrible. That was terrifying. That is why I was really surprised by this mental institution. The one that, that, that should be good because it is this kind of open type. Yes, 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 just because of that. And I would like to make a parallel with that, with uh, the overall history of photography of the 20th century, and I would like to mention Dorothea Lang and Walker Evans, who are basically the founders of the social photography in the US, and every one of them has been actually working for the, either for the State Department or for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the US, and they have been working as the photographers that has been needed for the certain reforms to be implemented, and all of those Legacy, the legacy that they've left is actually depicting the lowest layers of the so society of the 20s. So where the bankrupt farmers, the homeless people, the migrants, that it all has been depicted to support the state cause, to support the state support and to the development of the overall reforms in the US. And in your work in 90s was, let us put it this way, the anti-state work. So what you have been depicting in your photos and fixating in your photos that was against the main image that our state wanted to create. So what do you think about your work right now? So do you have the position as a photographer that does something for the state case, but uh, for the state coast, but not actually going into the opposition with what's going on in the state? Well, let's just let put the things aside. If you're making something for the state, it means that you're making something for the people, but not for the authorities that are currently in power. And there's not a lot of people who are actually currently in the government who are currently the authority, and they will disappear in a couple of years, but not the people will disappear. And I can say that for me, yes, I've had some constant conflicts. The people are asking, why are you filming that? Why are you shooting that? Why are you doing? 
doing that. It was a constant question raised, and you know, there's a person lying there, you, you just walk by, and you know, when you're making a photo, you're becoming the enemy of the state, number one, and you're becoming the enemy of all, all the people surrounding this person. In the 80s, that was even harder than that. At that moment, you could have even been imprisoned for making that kind of a photo. But I wasn't working there yet, because I was too young by that time. I was too young to be doing that, that by that time. But the people, the people who have uh, older than me, for example, Yuri Nesterov, the person that I've been talking most of the time in Lugansk, uh, during the weekday, during the days of, uh, you could talk to him, you could see what was going on in Europe in the f in the photography by that time, and he told me that he has been called out to the state security committee, and he, I was actually threatened with imprisonment, and he was so frightened that he was actually, he felt all of the power and all of the pressure of this machine, of this, well, you know, in my time, there were some of the police officers coming up to me, dressed as civilians, and they're asking me, why are you making those photos? But I could have a normal conversation with them. Even if when I got up to the police department, I would still walk out of it with my camera and with my films. I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have left that all behind. Either they respected me or whether they just didn't want to deal with journalists at that point of time. You know, I was... Um, I was a half-time employed in the, um, in, in the paper for the young people, but actually it worked even that time. Right now, I don't know how to say that, because is it easier or harder to get somewhere? But you know, there is a lot of topics available right now, a lot of topics available for you to keep on working, for you to keep on um, updating this overall book of time. And now we will see like all the, the free territories that uh, you went to just after they were freed, there was a situation when I don't even know where uh, you were allowed to photograph where uh, there they hated everybody. Because people have seen death, people have seen shelling, but you still find people who are still forthcoming and who want to communicate. Uh, I mean, you have to stay there, too. I was really, really expecting for Luhansk to be freed, but... Unfortunately, that never ended up happening, but whatever you record then has become very, very important now. It's very important to make a record. Okay, I have a, a question from the audience, a very simple question. How do you distinguish good photography? How do you tell good photography from bad photography? That was sarcasm. You know, you, you can't get everybody to like you. Some people are more interested in conventional photography. Some are connoisseurs. Um, some people appreciate um, what's in the frame. I think that photo if photography evokes some kind of emotion, it is good. It doesn't matter what he's, it's even about. Maybe there is some uh, additional mission or values besides the message that you're trying to bring across. I think that the pictures you've taken with the ambulance series, uh, you've... Uh, but then you understood... Uh, you, you've haven't published it for a while, but then you published it. So what, what did you understand and why did you? Well, it was a matter of chance. Uh, I, Katerina Filuk brought uh, Mauro Tagati, an Italian publisher, uh, two years ago. He just came to this exhibition and he said, okay, I want to publish this. I never thought 
that this topic matter is that not everybody really wants to see. I thought it was not meant to be published. This was unexpected for me as well, more than anybody actually. But probably what you're talking about is that when regular photography, just a regular picture becomes a document, maybe in 15 to 20 years, uh, these pictures, after they mature in time, they finally find their chance and place in history. I had this intuitive feeling, but I, I was not sure that this was ever to become a book. But time, hindsight is always 20-20. Uh, time always divides things into good and bad things. In the 90s, I would be told that this is terrible, this is never meant to be published. The uh, passport series would also be called terrible, because you call... Uh, you, were, you were meant to make passport photos, not what you made, but only in New York and... Time magazine, I was first told that we won't only publish this, but we also expect a book. We also want you to put a book on our table, just like them. But, but there's only 36 frames. But they, nevertheless, they insisted that this needed to be a book. So maybe in a year, we are now expecting a new book. So I cannot even evaluate my own photos. They really get duly appraised by time and the next generation. I'm very concerned with how the, tw the 20-somethings and 30-somethings who live or used to live in Luhansk now uh, appreciate my photograph. And, uh, they seem to be fairly appreciative and they seem to be thankful for me, uh, to me for maintaining uh, that period of time for them and preserving it for them. But they're not historians, they're not curators, uh, they're not art experts. They're just regular people, but their opinion ends up mattering. And whether or not I make it to museums and catalogs, uh, I don't know, it depends on the general process of photography. Well, you definitely did end up in a gallery, so now we have 10 more minutes of uh, our session. First of all, I'd like to invite you to our exhibition in 3D. Welcome No Entry, uh, which is available in uh, ISO. You can either watch it in a browser or in VR, uh, and a VR headset which will guarantee full immersion. I'd like to ask you about this thing. What kind of emotion would you, or kind of impression or contemplation would you expect from your audience after viewing your exhibition, or maybe the questions for them to ask? Uh, well, in general, I would want people to feel something, some kind of emotion, and it doesn't really matter for me what it ultimately is. But honestly speaking, when everything is said and done and the work is finished, you are not able to evaluate it anymore. What's important here is showing, bringing my work into the world. I do not expect no positive or negative opinion. Everything's already happened. Everything else is history. But if someone tells me whether my photography is good or it's bad, or someone will just, you know, get frustrated, or someone praises me, I don't care, because this is the kind of work that I choose to put out. I already did put out into the world as a book or as an exhibition, and it's probably going to be published in yet another book, because an Italian 
publisher will publish the uh, my psychiatric series uh, in color. Does it require commentary for international or Italian audiences? Of course, of course. There's, uh, Mikhailo Pliyevsky will, uh, will write the text, he lives in Chicago, and he said, you know, it's very difficult, you have to explain this to the entire world, because this is implicitly understood for us. Now, the text is being authored, and uh, the book is now in let's say, the mock-up, we're preparing the mock-up. Okay, as I, uh, well, as I wrap up this conversation so fast, I thought, what are we even going to talk about these one and a half hours, but actually I have a dozen of questions about the uh, this deleted series and everything that happened uh, or displaced series and everything that happened after uh, 2014 um, so I probably would like to wrap leave this here but uh, we'd like to thank DocuSpace and the curators of the program uh, for this opportunity to talk about these pictures that we are, you can see in the gallery. Actually, uh, please uh, pay special attention at, to the picture with uh, the two men near a piano. This is almost a Lynchian frame, which you can unpack at length with more and more layers of meaning coming in. So I thank Alexander for this conversation. Um, I hope that your book find a, uh, books find a lot of readers. Uh, I'd like to say that behind me I have a couple of works which I live with and they live along with me. This is from Lilies and from Displaced, from Deleted. So, yeah, as we wrap up, we'd like to say that we have an inclusive audio guide uh, with our event. Uh, there are comments by Alexander Chikminov himself. And, uh, this was made by the uh, Accessible Cinema NGO. So thank you for your attention, and until we meet again, thank you, thank you. It was, it's been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much, DocuDays.